Hello and welcome to Bold Leadership. I'm Colin Pooler, your co-host, and along with Kavis Reed, we're dedicated to the discussions of leadership. We have entertaining conversations on the challenges, learnings, ups and downs, and fundamentals of leadership. Our podcast involves interviews with people across the spectrum of business, public policy, community, athletics, and across a whole range of ages. So enjoy along with us, every guest and every conversation we have. Laugh a little bit, and don't worry, you don't have to be bold to enjoy it. Uh, so, gave us a hand to tell you what happened uh, yesterday. Uh, after we recorded with, with Craig, this is a true story. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, I should have told you this part of the story first. So, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I got, I got my wife a, a different vehicle uh, a couple, couple of weeks ago. And mine's, mine's been sitting in the shop, you know, waiting for parts to come from some other part of the planet <laughs> to come here. And, and so it's, it's, it can't be driven, right? Cause there's some, there's some computer chip fusey, whatever. <laughs> and so it needs this and they have no idea when it's coming, <laughs> like none whatsoever. So I'm like, man, that, that's an expensive chunk of metal that you can't do anything with. So it's sitting at the back of the dealership, great. Right? Well, they're waiting for these things, and uh, so you know, I get her this car. It's a nice little car, and and, uh, and I'm like, hey, can, can I borrow your car? Uh-oh. <laughs> right? right. So here I am. I'm, I'm now begging my wife if I could borrow her car because it's you know it's 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 nice. It's got nice little appointments to it and stuff. So so so. Just before Christmas, when it was really, really cold, I said, hey, you mind if I use your car? Because it's got the remotes. It's in the, it was in the garage. <laughs> or, 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 right. <laughs> sitting outside, it's cold. So I thought, well, at least I can get in a warm car and can go about my... So I, I... So she said, yeah, yeah, okay. Now, I don't know if this happens to you, but usually if my wife quickly agrees... He needs gas. He needs up, gas. Yeah. He needs gas. <laughs> <laughs> so you know it. So I, I get in the car, and I, I'm going like I'm going to the gym. I thought, I go to the gym, I'll come home. There's, like, no gas in this thing. <laughs> and so, so I get to the gym, and I go, I don't know if I'm going to make it home. <laughs> so, all right, no worries, no worries. So this is this is in the morning. Uh, I think it was it was it wasn't Christmas Eve. It was a day before Christmas Eve. So I wasn't going into the office. I, I think it was a Friday. I wasn't going in the office necessarily. Although I had to pick something up. Someone had sent a gift for me, and it was sitting on my desk. So I picked that up, and then I'm on the way home, and I'm not sure if I'm gonna make if I'm gonna make it. So I stop at this gas station, um, and and I I, I want to be careful because I don't want to I don't. Wanna, I'll just, I'll, I'll tell you, but I'm going to leave a few details out. <laughs> so I go to this gas station that's on Albert Street. It's a very famous Canadian gas station. And it's right next door to a very famous Canadian coffee shop. <laughs> where you can get like donuts and bagels and brownies and things like that. So I, I go to it, and I mean the the, the 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 shop, the coffee shop has been next to this place for years, but it's kind of discounted gas. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to go there. I can make it there. I can't make it all the way home, but I can make it to the gas station. And so I'm outside. I don't even have gloves on, and I'm freezing, and it is cold, and the wind is blowing, and I'm thinking, man, I could really use a hot cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm, so I'm pumping this thing, and just across the parking lot is this, is this place, and I could see people going in and out of it, walking in and coming out, but there's only a couple of cars around there, and I didn't really look up at the sign because oh, you know, it's a very famous yeah. sign, and I didn't realize that I, 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 I guess I forgot that that this building was sold to another company. <laughs> and and while they changed some of the signage, the shape of the sign is exactly the same. 
So I go to walk over to get a cup of hot tea from what ended up being the cannabis shop. <laughs> 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 no, I didn't. I, hey, no judgment, no judgment. But I, I wasn't. That that's not what I was thinking. Hey, I'll get a, a cup of tea and, and a brownie. That's not what I was thinking. Man. <laughs> Here's the question: What time was it? Oh, this was this was like I don't know nine in the morning or something. This was in the morning. different things on the windows. I didn't think anything of it, right? I just thought, okay, it's just there to kind of keep the sun from. But when you're that cold, you're thirsty. You don't think, yeah. You yeah, yeah. yeah you, you don't really think about this stuff. So this is all because I was trying to get my wife her her coffee. I mean, I, I get, get get some gas in her. So, I mean, it was, so, so then yesterday, so now I have to come back to yesterday. <laughs> so yesterday, um, we, we uh, I think I mentioned we were going to go over to my yeah. grandmother's place to fix something on, on a light. <clears throat> so no, no problem. Going to go in, going to go over. I said, okay, well, I'll tell you what, why don't we, why don't we do that? And um, maybe just the two of us will, you know, go on a little date night. Like, well, we'll do that and we'll just go out and get something to eat and, and relax. And, and uh, so that's cool. So then she goes, well, remember, this is our anniversary. Uh-oh. And I'm like, anniversary? <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> I got married in July. I don't know yeah. Married, but... <laughs> Did I miss something? <laughs> yeah, there's something, there's something that's not, what do you mean? And she's like, well, don't you remember? This was, this is when we oh, met. Oh, boy. I'm like, oh, right. <laughs> But the problem was, and, and this is what saved me, this is what saved me, is I met her uh, the night before uh, New Year's Eve, right? And that, that was the first time we met. There were a whole bunch of people there, and there were a couple of common friends, and that's how we met. And we had actually exchanged numbers. I got her phone number that night. And I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call this girl. Yeah, yeah. But, and so that was all cool. The next day, I went skiing with some buddies, and I hit my head and got a concussion. Lost my memory. <laughs> I didn't remember her. Oh. I didn't remember the phone number. And this one, like, I it just like it was the very next day, right? And um, now it came with me and skiing. I've only skied twice in my life, and both times nearly okay. died. Yeah, you're so dead. Yeah, you're dead. Yeah. Still, <laughs> yeah I'm done. I'm done. So the first time I ran into some fence or something and nearly <laughs> broke my leg, <laughs> and the second time I cracked my head. <laughs> and that was it. I don't. I was like, <laughs> so that, that, that this explains a lot of things, okay? But it is. A, it's a good thing that she pursued me because she lived across the street from a guy that I knew, and I and, and I would stop by his place, and she she'd see me and kind of come out and look. I don't remember you. <laughs> <I> just... <laughs> so so she's like, well, you know, don't you remember this is this is anniversary we met? And I'm like. Honey, I, I, I got a concussion the next day. I don't remember. <laughs> I'm trying to save myself now, right? So I don't think I put myself in the best no. way. But the question is, yeah. do you remember, did you remember <laughs> after? <laughs> oh, can, you know what, for real, what happened was six months wow. later. Six months later. Now, we had a couple friends kind of in between that would say, Hey, you remember this? I'm like, yeah, sorry. Yeah. You know what? But I found her number in my room. It was on a blue piece of paper, like a, like a bristle board card kind of thing. And it had her first name. In this oh, number. man. And I'm like, Why do I have this <laughs> who is this number? person? <laughs> so I just decided I'm just going to call it. Right. And 30 years later, we're still together. <laughs> <laughs> two kids. I'm like, yeah, two two kids. It's like, what? What is like? How does this happen? Right? 
So yeah, yeah. That, that, that. So so here we are going out now. Okay. So I've already kind of got myself in trouble for kind of not remembering that I forgot <laughs> because you know of the I mean? concussion. Because of concussion. Because of the concussion. I almost got another concussion when we got because then it was like, okay, we're going out. And it's like, um, do you want to use your car? <laughs> Yeah, we're getting, yeah, yeah, okay, we take my car. I'm thinking, okay, is it got gas? <laughs> that was my first thought, right? So, <laughs> so no, no problem, you know, and, and, you know, hit the remote start, and the, you know, car was already in the driveway at that point because she'd gone out somewhere. And, uh, and so she, she goes, oh, here, you drive. Okay, so I, I take the key and, and, uh, and I hop in the, I'll hop in the front seat. And don't want to ask me why I did this, but I hit the heated seat button. For my seat, I didn't hit her. Ooh. He didn't see. <laughs> so, so she gets in the car, and I hit the, he- the heated mirror. I hit the heated defrost oh. thing, and I hit my car seat. And she's just looking at me, <laughs> <laughs> waiting, <laughs> waiting. Yeah, just like waiting. And this is like. <laughs> What do you want? Yeah. What, what, what's up? What's up with my seat? I'm like, oh, my bad. My bad. Oh man, I was fixing for a concussion. Man. The second one. Another one. <laughs> I see. But, but here's the question I ask: Why is it now? I'm the tourist for not having gas in my car, so I, I have to I have to preface that. <laughs> My my car always give me a warning. Hey, idiot! You need gas. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, <laughs> here's the question: You notice she calculated the distance from the gym back to the house and knew yeah, that you yeah. had to get gas. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it only had twenty three kilometers left in the tank, according to right. So I'm driving like, wait a minute. <laughs> You see these lights flashing? Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> more of the And somehow or other, when she'd want to use my car, because, you know, it's a, it was like right after I'd fill it. Like every single time, I'd fill the car and i come home. Can I borrow your car? Next morning, I said, hey, do you mind if I use your car? Yeah, yeah, sure. It was, it was always full. Or clean. This is going on. Or years. just clean. It was just clean, yeah. I just, I just washed and yep. polished it. Well, that's perfect. I'm heading out. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> yeah. I got one more question. <laughs> if she hears this, I'm oh, dead. You know that, right? I mean, so. <laughs> I'm, getting, I'm getting another concussion. That, that'll, that'll be the you next You know what? Thing. That will hold up in court, though. The concussion thing will hold up in court. <laughs> <laughs> I think you got a valid excuse there, but well, hey, t- temporary yeah, insanity is, is, is going to yeah, 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 yeah. I don't remember you for six months. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wouldn't tell her that part, but when you went to the coffee shop, <laughs> well, okay. To be honest, I didn't actually walk in it. I was walking towards it and kind of glanced up, and it wasn't. It wasn't. Yeah, yeah, the previous. Yeah, yeah. it wasn't. It wasn't yeah, the brand, yeah. right? You know, it wasn't the famous yeah, Canadian yeah, yeah. brand. Where it was like, <laughs> and, and, and so, <laughs> but I'm about to step in, and I realize this doesn't. This isn't right. <laughs> what? <laughs> like, did anybody see me? Right? I mean, that that that's the real thought. Did that's anybody exactly see me? where I was going? <laughs> because the the part I left out was a crop a, a, in the same part. There's a strip. In the strip mall, there's a company. The CEO is a friend of mine. <laughs> and and their office looks looks over this parking lot. And and often what I've done is I when I have stopped there for gas, I'd stop there for gas and I'd stop in and say yeah. hi. Right? I'm thinking they must have sat there and watched. <laughs> you walk across. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look around. <laughs> <laughs> I told a word out of Kansas anymore. <laughs> yeah. That, 
That was well, my question. Like, like I said, no judgment. It's just, you know, it's just not my thing. So you, know what I mean? you get into the office and everyone's <laughs> looking at you going, yeah, I know why you're so happy in the morning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How was your morning yeah. ground, Colin? <laughs> and your, hey, your tea. <laughs> yeah, my your tea. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Can we go get some tea <laughs> at the coffee shop? <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. But th- it is true. But but it, but I'm I, it's my wife's fault because because I got in there only twenty three kilometers <laughs> left in the tank. I get the concussion, and I had to make the round trip. <laughs> go back to the concussion story. <laughs> Your default is the concussion. <laughs> It's that dark concussion yeah. from 30 years ago. <laughs> yeah. So when she brings this up yesterday, I mean, she says, you know, it's her anniversary, right? Like, <laughs> you know, I, 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 like the calculator yeah, like, is going in my head. It's like, yeah. yeah. Are you playing a joke with <laughs> me? I'm like, didn't we get married in July? Okay, this morning was <laughs> what, what are you talking about? I'm like, wow, well, well, whatever's. <laughs> oh, man. Not bad. Yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, I'm full of questions today, but did she ever celebrate this the year before? Oh, no, this is the first time. Yeah, so. Up. I mean, I think it is. Yeah, I you got this. an excuse. I mean, it's just like, why, 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 like, what happened here? You have an excuse. It's never came out. You had a concussion <laughs> soon thereafter. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I. I mean, yeah. my bad, but <laughs> this never came up. Wow. I'm going to have to use that excuse for everything from now on because I, I, I just, wow. Oh, God. So, maybe it's just us, but this is, <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry. I, I won't bake any brownies for you. I won't. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yeah. No. I no. I don't. I don't need anything with a special ingredient in it or anything like that. I'm good. Here's what I, why I have an, uh, a problem with a lot of the cannabis shops. They're in. <laughs> they're in mainstream uh, shopping areas. They're not in like discreet areas. So you can be walking by, going to another store, and appear to be coming out of the <laughs> cannabis shop, and someone sees you. <laughs> <laughs> Like think about it, they're they're positioned right by the grocery store. They're, oh you know, yeah, yeah, right right beside Harry. Yes. Yeah, I mean it's, it's like, like could you at least put it on the outskirts of town so, so that I don't know. think about it. You see all these people walking out, and if you're pulling in, you're going, hmm, I wonder if he was at the cat. Yeah. 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 So if anyone's listening, oh, can man. you please move all cannabis shots? Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> I really like that yeah. gas station because I get an extra couple cents <laughs> off a liter just by, you know, I have this little thing and they give me extra two cents. I mean, it's it's it's, it's great. Oh, man. Oh. I, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm not laughing at you because it, 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 today you got to be, it can happen to anybody, man. Exactly. <laughs> I, I, one is by a famous grocery store right near my house. And it's tucked between the grocery store and a paint store. So you go buy paint or you go to a grocery store, you have to go buy it. So my whole thing is, is that you can be seen as <laughs> coming out of the cannabis shop. So I park on the far side of the parking lot. <laughs> Take that. <laughs> well, and, and you know we do drug testing in our <laughs> office, right? So I'm like, oh. <laughs> I walk in and my HR director's like, <laughs> come on over here, Colin. <laughs> so how much business is that paint store losing because no one wants to come to the paint store? <laughs> Because they think that people will think that they're going to the cannabis shop. Well, you know, if you want to make some quick bucks, you can just get sit out there with bags of Doritos. <laughs> and I mean, no disparity whatsoever. I'm not trying to. <laughs> anyhow. <clears throat> anyhow. Okay. <laughs> oh, we are so off topic all the time. <laughs> I mean, it's fun. 
Hey man, like I, I was looking at something. This was this was literally, literally five and a half years ago. Literally five and a half years ago, um, when you were in Regina, right after you, right, right after you stole the <laughs> <laughs> and after the other session. You, you, you spoke at a you, you spoke at a Regina Chamber of Commerce lunch, right? And um, I had a chance to introduce you. And, and Industry West Magazine did a bit of a story um, on that, um, and where you you talked about ice leadership and zero to team. And you know it was at that time it was in the context of of, of safety because that's. You know, for physical safety from the construction because that that that's obviously where I, I've, I've worked in but you know that that topic has much a much broader a much broader application which I realize you adapted for but um, you know I was I was reshared this article not that long ago when I read it and I thought you know um, you know I think I think people could really benefit from um, hearing your thoughts on and rehearing your thoughts on on leadership and, and, and ice being the intellectual communal and emotional elements of leadership which really we've been talking about that in, in, the, in the last couple of episodes we've recorded um we've we've we, we did a deep dive into each one of these things in one way shape or form but you found a way to consolidate those concepts um it, you know both in in direct leadership but also building of teams to build a high performance teams. And, um, you know, I, I wonder if you, you know, be willing to kind of reshare that because I'd love to hear it again. And, and, uh, I guess it was, it was phenomenal to be, to be honest with you. Yeah. No, thank you, Colin. <clears throat> yeah. I do remember that scary moment. I, I think I'm going to be banned from most Canadian cities. <laughs> 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 I think BC, the cities of BC are still safe right now, but it's very intense time coming back to Regina. And uh, uh, the good part was walking beside you, <laughs> nice bodybuilder. <laughs> I felt safe <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> but it was a very intense time, but uh, we got through it. And, uh, Colin, uh, what I appreciate most about chatting with you and our conversations about leadership is we understand the gravity of the topic and how broad it is, but yet we some, somehow tend to have fun around it and just be ourselves. One of the things I really feel that we have done over time and times have changed is that we put leadership in that perfect box. It has to be perfect. And it is not that. Leadership is somewhat fluid but it has core things that are immutable, things that are survived the test of time, will always be critically important. They're foundational things. And one of the studies that I've been doing in terms of leadership and primarily servant leadership is why would people follow you? And trying to make it simple, I think people will follow you for three reasons, because they have to. That's because the title or something dictates it. The second reason is they want to. You've done something with the position that you have that allows people to see that you are a person that have their best interests at heart. You're a competent individual. Your emotions are pretty much steady. You're not too high, you're not too low. You have that good disposition. And the final stage, which to me takes a lot of work <clears throat> is they need to and need being in that you have invested so much into the individuals that their growth and development is somewhat dependent on you they need what you have to offer it's you are that person that is a mentor and Maxwell does a phenomenal job of diving into this in a lot of his series and a lot of his books yeah. in terms of the leadership levels and in studying and reading a lot of his works i wanted to kind of say okay put it in simple football terms as we always try to do 
<laughs> you got to simplify it for us. Folks, <laughs> when, when when you're coaching football, you realize uh, you're always coaching the individual that probably has the least capacity to learn. Therefore, you want to make it as simple and keep reiterating. The ICE principle says that your intellectual skills, the I, the intellectual skills, my ability to lead you, I need to prove, I need to show that I have the mental intellectual prowess to be able to navigate you to, towards the things that you want. I am invested in learning as a leader. I'm not a complete individual. I am invested in learning all the time and not just the academic learning, but the learning of my environment, the learning of the personality, the learning of the climate that we're in, the learning of the competition, et cetera. All those things says that I'm invested in trying to make certain that I'm always advancing. If I'm a coach, I'm always up to date on the latest trends. I'm always up to date on new techniques. I'm always up to date on safety. I know all the free agents, et cetera. That's the part that gets people to say, okay, he has the, the mental capacity to be able to pull this, this wagon. The communal aspect, the C aspect, the communal. There's no good leader, in my opinion, that does not understand the community, that does not invest in understanding each of the individual parts. No one is unimportant. Everyone. When I walked into the building of a stadium, <clears throat> I wanted to know the person from the time I enter that door to the time I exit that, that, that building. I want to know the janitors. I want to know the receptionists. I want to know the salespeople. I want to know all the assistant coaches. And I want to know something about their families. I will remember the birthdays of kids. I will remember their names. I want to make certain that they understand that I am fully invested in this community. And the community is the individual parts. I want to know your idiosyncrasies. I want to know what makes you tick. Even if you're a coach with a title or status, I need to know what makes you tick. When, when, you, when you talk about that, and, and uh, I'm going to go back and ask you a question on the intellectual piece of it, but, but, but focusing on the communal aspects. In, in every leadership role, we always talk about the need to, to understand stakeholders. We, you know, we put a fancy title, we call them stakeholders, but, but it, it means everybody from, like you said, the person who is um, you know, the custodians for the building to the receptionist, to, to those who you have some investment in, <clears throat> but you also understand the business environment. You understand the business community. You try to understand what's the what's the temperature that those who I'm serving, whether you're entertaining them <laughs> or you're providing some other type of service, um, you, you want to understand their needs, their desires, their what makes them tick in this relationship, and. Um, and, and I, I agree with you. I'm, I'm glad you talked about it because the mistake that, a mistake that um, I've seen, and at times I've made the same mistake too, is that I've drifted away from that. Sometimes we get, you know, maybe a bit insulated. We get um, a little bit cocooned. Um, and over time, it doesn't happen suddenly, but over time, we start to become distant from certain stakeholders, from certain people, whether it's, you know, uh, those who, who work directly in the organization that, that you're working with, um, or those that, 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 that you serve in terms of the customer, where they feel you're not necessarily relevant anymore because you're just, you've lost a connection. And, um, and you know, and, and any really successful long-term organization has figured out a way to stay engaged to keep engaged, which is the you know a fancy word now that we're using, but to keep engaged with all those folks. So I, I uh, you know, I really appreciate you talking about. Yeah, that. and Colin, uh, when I became the head coach with the Edmonton football team, uh, the first thing I did after the press conference was went into my shabby office and 
clear out some space to start to work. And the work was, I did not want to talk to someone with a title. During that time, we had more managers than we did people under the, under the managers. I, I thought it was really a topsy-turvy kind of a structure. I did not talk to one of them. I talked to everyone in ticket. I talked to everyone that worked in as administrative assistants. I talked to people in the custodial janitorial staff. And I wanted, and I asked one same, uh, question. What do you see as wrong here? And I wanted to know from their perspective, because believe it or not, I think you see more from the bottom positions, quote unquote, than you do from the top positions. I think their peer, their view is more wide. They're more observant than we naturally are as leaders. I want their opinion. And a hundred percent of them, Colin, and I, I'm, I'm quite confident I talked to over seven people. I can probably name their names. Still have a good relationship with most of them. Unfortunately, a couple have passed away. But a hundred percent of them said, we don't think everyone feels part of the Eskimos at the time family, that we've become segregated. And that wasn't the culture that I grew up in in that organization. It was a culture where you walked in and you felt like you were a part of a family, truly a part of something. And you were afraid of being the weakest link. So whether or not you were a rookie or the star quarterback, you were treated the exact same. And you had that sense of pride about you. That was the first priority that I had was to get us back on that kind of a mentality. So the very next press conference, my topic was controversial, but it had a strategy. And I said, we will not lose a game to that team to the South. I said it. Rookie head coach, first head coaching job, I said it. The reason I said it, Colin, is I know that that topic brings the organization together. Mm -hmm. regardless of our situation when we bring that team up it binded us together so I yeah thought, i can imagine the strategy was put the pressure on the entire organization that that's the goal and the focus that was the goal and the focus so amazingly we didn't lose a game to that organization that year <laughs> and you can see that all of our effort was towards us getting back to dominance in the province. And when you start to see everyone work in that alignment, we took off the title of manager of so-and-so, manager of so-and-so. It was, we got to live up to this, this claim that we're going to do that. Right. And the community started to... It started to cool Exactly. And okay. that's where we, we found that pivotal point that glue to start us towards functioning as an obvious goal. I didn't have a lot of time. I needed something quick to bind the community. Then we can work on bringing back the elements that made us such a fabulous community. And we started to do that again and making everyone feel important and bringing in people that had the history and combine them with new people and having barbecues to just let people be themselves. Every day four, the day before the game, we would have a barbecue. The injured guys would be cooking burgers and steaks and all this stuff, and we would invite everyone in. And people started to just talk about each other. And I realized we have them we have them because we're back to enjoying each other. And when you enjoy each other, all the other stuff, the challenges that come, we know that we have a symbiotic relationship and we're going to work together to, to resolve it. 
when people bind it, you, 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 you build it another strength. Like you, you, you build the strength to work through adversities. You build the strength to work through failures. You build the strength to, to, you know, to move the proverbial yardsticks, regardless of it. You know, I realize we're talking about football here, but it, but the application goes into any sort of team. And uh, so, you know, as you're as you're saying this, I'm thinking some of the conversations we've had, whether it be with Dave Smith or. or or Craig Dowden, or, or even with, with, with Caitlin and, and, and our other podcasts, um, there, there's a there's a new power that kind of emerges from that, and, and I imagine there, there, this this whole sense of loyalty um, must have been a big thing. You know, I mean, you went to business school. I went to business school. Um, you know, we did these uh, graduate studies, and you know, the the thing that the picture that comes out when you people go to these schools, they come out with all these with all these tools to be able to do these fancy strategies, and we have these we have these great names for these these uh, you know, different um, different strategic tools that that we can lay out and um, and, and models, and, and they're wonderful. I mean, I I use them like to this day, and they're they're great to create structure. But strategy by itself is is kind of useless unless you've got this other underlying community, this underlying culture, this underlying uh, piece that you're describing, which is which is really the horsepower to make everything else work. And so I you know I appreciate you talking about that. When so when when you're in these moments, I mean, and I and, and I. I appreciate the pressures that you're under. This is why I'm, I'm excited that you're using this example because you're in a very public. <laughs> everybody can see what you're doing. I mean, I, it's not even a glass house, or if it's a glass house, it's a very clean yeah. glass, right? I mean, everybody yeah. can see what's going on. Everyone's got an opinion on what you should be doing. Um, the pressures are phenomenal. Um, you, you know, you're, you're, you're you, you can't afford to kind of take it easy sometimes. Or at least the pressure suggests that, that that you can't do that, and um, and you need something quick and simple that everybody could coalesce around in order to achieve a goal. Yeah, and there again, again, what I appreciate what we're trying to accomplish is we're not trying to oversimplify leadership. We're trying to make people understand that. We don't need all the fancy jargon to explain and to cultivate positive leadership. We don't. We need to get down to the gut core issues. And the gut core issue is people's trust. That's what I see leadership is, the management of people's trust. They're trusting you as that person designated as a leader or that person that ascends as a leader. They're trusting in you that you're going to have their best interest both individually and collectively at heart and you're going to take that very seriously and all the actions and information that you consume and actions you take is about that trust going back to that example and being raising your children quote unquote in the view of the public i wanted the organization to understand that the brand the brand, the family of this team was the most important thing. And when you are inside the compounds of the organization and when you're out in the community, you're still representative of that brand. And it's pride is when your children and your family go out in public, you wanna make certain everyone's properly groomed, our clothes are proper, we want to make certain the presentation is good. And not only for the optics, but because it makes you feel more spiritually and emotionally invested and more prideful. And regardless of the challenges that come, you build up such equity and pride in the community and within that you're going to be able to withstand it. The best thing that happened to us in 2011 was that we went through a five, six, seven, or whatever game win streak, and then we had a rash of injuries. Four of our starting five receivers got hurt, and we lost four games in a row, four in a row. And I knew it, it, it is a blessing, as we talked about in previous podcasts. Challenges are 
the pathway for growth. All we did, and all I kept emphasizing, let's not make an excuse and let's not change what we're doing. The names are going to change on this roster, but what we're doing is not going to change. We're not going to change scheme or or strategy. Because if we do that, we're saying what we believe as foundational things are not immutable. They have to remain consistent. And we remain consistent with what we were doing and how we were doing. There was never a panic. And when those injuries started to heal and we got those individuals back, we were able to finish strong. In those tough times when we had all the success in the world and then we hit that proverbial challenge wall, we were able to keep chiseling through, chiseling through, chiseling through. And then we came out on the other side and things kept going smoothly. We're able to get our first home playoff game in a number of years. That's not a pride thing or pat yourself on the back. It was more of that's the way we do things. This is not something that's a surprise. It's what is expected. This is, and not saying it, but you're portraying it. This is how we do it. This is what we do. This is what we expect. It's not a surprise that this happened. That to me, Colin, is where all cultures, all communities start to hit their proverbial stride is when you expect that the things that you're doing is going to yield good results. And even when the challenges come, the things that we're doing, because it's so foundational, so well vetted, that we're going to be able to navigate around through or over those challenges. This is phenomenal. I, I, you know, and I could see the bridge from, you know, when you talk about the intellectual, that's pretty, the intellectual skills, you didn't spend a lot of time on that. That's probably good for somebody like me because, <laughs> because, because I, I think what you're saying, Hey, you gotta be smart enough, but you don't need to necessarily be the smartest guy in the room, <laughs> which we, you know, we've, we've had this discussion before about it, it actually can be quite a negative to try to be the smartest person in the room because you, as the leader, you're relying on your team to, to, for, for its success. And you don't allow people's ideas, their thoughts, their, their contributions to come forward because they're intimidated by their leader. Who's trying to gain to be the smartest person in the room. And could, could you talk about that a little yeah. bit more? Cause we, we did talk about that recently on another case. Absolutely. And again, management of people's trust. If I hire you to be the offensive coordinator, defensive coordinator, special teams coordinator, I'm saying that I trust that you're going to do your very best and you have the ability to lead your unit and collaboratively come together and we're going to be successful. When we had our coaches meeting, the conversation was always about complimentary football. What does that mean? That means that the offense is going to have to make decisions and always think about what's going to happen on special teams and on defense. The special team is going to make decisions what's going to happen on those sides of the ball. When everyone at those units start to think about the consequence of their actions and the strategy around those other units, now we start to get a more uh, unified thinking. So my decision is not isolated for my unit. It's not my unit. It's our, us. Colin, whenever I walk into a football or a business society and I hear people say, my, I, me, the red flags go up. I always used to tell coaches, positional coaches are very territorial. The defensive line coach, my guys, my guys. No, they're not your guys. They're our players. And our just doesn't mean this coaching staff. It means the entire organization. Stop. Start using those terms that train us mentally to think globally, to think communal. I, I yeah, I really create. You used a word in there that um, you used the word complementary. That the the functions of maybe different units within it within a bigger team. It'd be looking at it from a complementary perspective. So it's not just the success of your unit, whether it be, you know, if you're in a large organization, that it'd be, the, you know, the 10 or 12 people that, that may be reporting to you that it's not just their individual success 
as, as that, that part of this bigger team, but the fact that the things that you do need to be complementary to the others in the, in the rest of the business. Um, I, I took a, I took a customer service course a number of years ago. And most of them we think about well, customer service, we think, you know, the person who's walking in at, through the front door, who's going to come to the counter and is looking for a service. But this particular course was looking at my colleagues as customers. And, and how do I put them first? I think it was called putting customers first, if I remember correctly. And it was a week long uh, group session where we actually had to think about the impacts of what I was doing while I might have been good at my job and be, maybe appear to be successful in my job. As a team, we could be completely failing because I wasn't thinking about serving the next person in the value chain. Because collectively, is where we bring the value to, you know, to our broader customer. So it, you know, the, the, the term complementary, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I'm really pleased that you use that word because it's not a word that we necessarily use when we're talking and, you know, in, in our, in our, in our teams and our organizations, you're very right. Many times you're talking, well, you know, in my team or in my unit, we got this accomplished. And, you know, as the, as the senior leader, as a head coach or CEO or, you know, where you've got kind of a portfolio to look after, you look at this and go, oh my goodness, that success might've been the beginning of our failure because, because <laughs> while it made you look really good, nobody else was able to function correctly because you kind of sucked up all the <laughs> oxygen and it doesn't, it doesn't link well with the rest of the, of the, of the machinery, the rest of the team. So collectively we ended up failing. Absolutely. And again, I, I could talk for days on this. It's, it's so critically important, Colin, um, that we understand that everything that appears to be what it is, isn't. And when you really are forensic about the analysis of results, you realize why things happen. For example, um, I had a conversation with some reporters uh, that talked about the amount of interceptions a quarterback threw. And instead of having the conversations, I did something unconventional, which uh, I was later uh, deemed as too media friendly. I brought a reporter in, sat him in the film room, and I watched the film with them, not to embarrass the individual, but to educate them. And I showed them why the quarterback through those interceptions. The receivers weren't where they were supposed to be. To thousands of people, it was the quarterback's fault. For us who knew, the receivers weren't at the right depth. They were short on their depth. The quarterback threw where they were supposed to be and they weren't there. And now we understand the relationship. And now that reporter, every time he wrote a story, he wrote it after he would rewatch the game. He would not write a story until he went home and rewatched the game to validate what he thought he saw. Right. So, so in essence, he was he was beginning to ask the questions of why. Why? Right. The the, the blameless autopsy. Yes. <laughs> right. and, and 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 that you know that that's the element that I, I really appreciate you talking about from an intellectual perspective, because that's, that, that's a place as, as, as leaders that I, I, I think we need to grow to it. So I'm certainly working on to try to understand the root of an issue, because that will put you in a better position to decide what's the avenue we need to take going forward. Exactly. What actions do we need to take to course correct? And I'm going to back up a few years prior to, and earlier in my career about three, four years in, I had an opportunity to interview for a head coaching job. And I spoke to someone whom I have a lot of, a lot of respect for. And I said, I'm not going to do it. And a lot of my friends were two, three, four years in and they're getting head coaching jobs. And I've worked with some people that have already been on their second head coaching job and we came in at the same time. And everyone's like, my God, are, why are you not getting these opportunity, opportunities? I didn't want them at the time, Colin, I was not ready. And I said to the individual, 
at 31, I'm not ready to be a head coach. It would be career suicide. My explanation at that time was I needed to learn all three sides of the ball. And I need to learn the micro and the macro of the team. So I asked questions. I hung out with the GM. I asked them how they put the roster together. I understood the the idiosyncrasies of the roster management. I was a special team coordinator that touched every unit and every position. I understood the the mentality and the attitude and the trigger points of all the positions from the old lineman to the defensive back. I had not coached on offense and I needed that experience. So I, for, I declined an opportunity to be a defensive coordinator to go to Saskatchewan to be a running backs coach and a special teams coordinator. That was the final piece I needed for me to feel comfortable as being a head coach in Canada. Now when I'm leading all of the coaches, none of them can say, I do not have experience. I understood their language. I can talk to the O-line coach about technique. I can talk to the D-line coach about technique. There wasn't a position on the field that I did not have an understanding of and understand their language and their jargon. That to me, when I left Winnipeg, I knew I was ready to be a head coach because I'd gone through that process. Prior to that, I wasn't a head coach in Canada. And I think that's the mistake a lot of leaders make. We're so caught up on getting that title versus having the preparation and the patience to gain the intellectual understanding the knowledge base to be able to speak to everyone, everyone, so that they know that you can empathize with their situation because you walked in that shoe. And you're not just some guy that is going to speak something they heard. You're speaking something you've experienced. So the rounding out. I'm going to just call it the rounding out of, of, of the experience, the rounding out of your learning, that continuous learning path that, that you said allowed you to empathize better with those who were, who were in those roles. Is that what I'm just saying? And, and you know, the, the fact that, you know, we're hearing over and over again how empathy is, is got to be one of the top demanded attributes of leadership today. But it's more than just, oh, I feel sorry for this person. It, it's it's like looking in the my boss had said looking in the donut glazed eyeballs of, of 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 your managers and appreciating and they know that you appreciating the challenges that that they're going through. Again, you're responsible for a portfolio, not just an individual set of tasks. And and so to develop that, it, it's okay to spend some time and it's okay to to volunteer in a lot of different kinds of organizations in order to gain enough experience, perspective, um, uh, learning from others, making mistakes so that you're better prepared to step into those roles in the future. So I mean, one of the reasons uh, you know, anybody who's worked with me, I, they, they will hear me frequently tell them, hey, volunteer for stuff, volunteer for stuff, volunteer for stuff internally, get involved with it, with, it, with external organizations because you're, you're going to get to learn stuff so much faster than you are just doing the single job that you're getting in and trying to take a, um, you know, a, a direct trajectory to your personal professional goals. It's, you know, the, the, the funny thing as a volunteer, you and I talk about this and as a volunteer, you can gain so much knowledge experience in areas that would not be things you would normally touch in your day-to-day -day roles. And the fact is when you're here, it's hard to get fired. Yes. So, yeah. you know, yeah. so you can you can make a lot of yeah. mistakes and, and and I mean yeah, yeah, and not get fired. Yeah. No. And if yeah, yeah, and if if they walk into the room and say, "Listen, um, thanks for volunteer, but we need yeah. to leave," you, that that's a signal yeah. that's pretty yeah. bad, right? So you got fired for a volunteer. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to that point, the, the yeah, um, sorry, Kyle. To that point, yeah, I. I you, you you said something I, I want to before my 
age and concussions get catch up to me. In that example, I, I talked about now having all three sides. I can walk onto the board and draw up a strategy and in depthly discuss that strategy with any of the coaches. I've seen head coaches and CEOs, upper management be compromised because they don't have a holistic knowledge of the organization and the intellectual understanding of all the parts or most of the parts. And what invariably happens is instead of going to that middle or upper management, you go to a subordinate and you try to get information out of them because you want to seem smarter when you go to talk to that management or that coordinator in the coaching realm. Now you start to talk to the positional coach instead of the coordinator because you don't have the intellectual understanding of what's happening. And you're trying to say, well, what's going on? Why isn't this working, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas I can walk directly to that leader and discuss the strategy on equal level. It gives him confidence or her confidence that I'm not compromising their authority with their people in the sense that I'm trying to get information from someone that they're leading. It's so much more healthy to have the intellectual understanding as a leader of all facets or as many as you possibly can so that you can be able to keep cohesion, keep collaboration and not compromise someone's authority within the hierarchy of the organization of flowchart. It is one of the deadliest things that can happen. And it's because you as a leader haven't invested. Who has the stories? The individual that went from the mailroom to the CEO. Imagine the institutional knowledge that that individual has and the practical knowledge to be able to go back and do things and work beside the mailroom clerk and organize things. How how much more empowering is that? And how much more uh, confidence do you, the people that are under your care have that they know that you can go from mailroom up to the research and development room, up to the finance uh, department, and be able to talk their language and not feel uncomfortable? That's the intellectual understand that I think most leaders need to attempt to have. That's, uh, that, that is awesome. That, so we, we, we've talked about the intellectual, we've talked about communal and it leads into this last piece, which is the emotional that, that, that you, that you talked about the emotional piece of it. And, and to some intellectual and emotional will sound like they don't go together <laughs> <laughs> because it's like, well, okay, left brain, right brain, is this all mushed up together? Tell me about the emotional aspect. Yeah, of you know, again, we spoke often that sometimes people think that you can, leaders are emotionless people. There are people that can't make mistakes. They can't laugh. They can't joke. They can't have fun. Um, they're emotionless. And that's the farthest from the truth. Because when you try to be that stoic, uh, unemotional leader, what happens is so many things are pent up inside of you that the proverbial, when the dam breaks, it all floods out and the valley below is going to be flooded and the results are not going to be pretty. It has been said thousands and thousands of times before us and not saying anything. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Um, that is so true, Colin. If I can show that I care about you, that I am truly invested in you, that you're going to be okay. We're going to navigate all situations together. You're not in this boat on this vast ocean alone. It's going to make everyone feel like they are part of something. And that's what we all want. It's human nature to want to feel a part of something cared for and cared about. After a loss, 
it was so re-energizing, so reinvigorating that the first people that were waiting for me were the receptionists, were the ticket people to give a hug and say, it's going to be okay. It made me feel, okay, I got this. Time to get back to work. It wasn't the president of the organization. It wasn't the chairman of the board. It were the receptionists, the custodial, the ticket salespeople, the true soldiers in the battle that say mm-hmm. it's going to be okay. When they're saying that, Colin, because you've shown that you cared about them, you sat and eat with them, you asked about their kids, you want to know how they're doing personally, and it's not about just being personal, it's about knowing the individual. You bring them a coffee on Fridays and you truly sit and listen to them and you're able to rehash conversations because you're actually listening to them or you implement an idea and thought that they had, that's showing care. That's showing appreciation. And now after a devastating loss, not to the team to the South, but to another team, (laughs) <laughs> they're waiting on you with gleeful, positive eyes saying, it's going to be okay because you made that emotional investment in them. The biggest compliment was we were 7 and 11 and a couple of reporters said, I can never tell whether or not you guys won a game or lost a game based on how the locker room was. It was always happy and stable. We never, quote unquote, lost the locker room. That's the biggest compliment I've ever gotten as a coach or as an individual because I knew those individuals in that organization knew that we cared about them. Therefore, they need to always have a championship attitude. And when it's raining or when it's sunny, our disposition is going to be the same because we're a family that cares about each other and want things to work. That to me, Colin, is what every leader should strive for. Not because we did it during our tenure, but it's because it's the right thing to do. When people know that you care about them, they'll go through the toughest of times with you and not and not compromise what the end goal is. Okay, this is this is this is awesome. Uh, you know, we're uh, I know we're at the top of the hour here. We're uh, out of time here for today, but this this is a phenomenal synopsis that um, you know I think any executive, uh, regardless if they're a sports fan or not, is going to be able to to draw from, or those who aspire to leadership, whether it be you know uh, I, I you know they have this two person popsicle standard organization with hundreds or thousands. Um, involved with it. So um, thank you for sharing it. Thank you for um, you know sharing some of the personal aspects of this because you know we talk about being vulnerable in our conversations and and um, and I really appreciate you doing that. So um, so keep your head bald and shiny <laughs> and smile lots <laughs> and stay away from the and stay away from the brownies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll stay out of certain shops and, and avoid avoid any future concussions. <laughs> you know I'm going to go do that. Excuse now. Anytime something happens. Oh yeah, um, you just <laughs> honey, it's, it's, it's those concussions. It's, it's, it's coming back on me. <laughs> it wasn't that 20 years ago. Yeah, but oh man, <laughs> it's. <laughs> Thank you for listening to this episode of Bald Leadership. If you enjoyed the show, please follow, like, and share. See you next time.